Today, the Supreme Court issued a ruling that could impact hundreds of January 6th defendants. The high court says that prosecutors overstepped when they charged rioters with obstructing an official proceeding, a charge that comes with a maximum of 20 years in prison. In a 6-3 ruling, the majority gives a very narrow reading of the law and says that prosecutors can only charge a crime if the defendant actually tampered with documents. Simply rioting to stop a proceeding apparently doesn't count. Attorney General Merrick Garland wrote that he was, quote, disappointed with the court's ruling while former President Trump is celebrating the decision. Remember, he has also been charged with obstruction by special counsel Jack Smith. Trump has spent months painting the January 6th rioters as patriots and political prisoners who have been unfairly prosecuted. So just what does this all mean? Joining me now is former attorney for Trump, Bill Brennan, and trial attorney and News Nation legal analyst, Misty Maris. Bill, Misty, great to have you both. Um, Misty, I'll start with you. Merrick Garland said the majority of the 1,400 people who've been charged for their actions on January 6th won't be affected. How many people does this ruling today affect? So there's about 350 people who are actually charged with this obstruction crime. But most, many of those individuals have been, been charged with other felonies as well. So the individuals who are going to have a direct impact right away are those that were charged only with obstruction. And that can be in a various different ways. Some have entered plea deals. Those plea deals could be vacated. Uh, some are awaiting trial and they've had continuances as trial is looming. Those might not go forward. So it's going to specifically impact those who are only charged with obstruction and not other felonies relating to January 6th. Okay. Uh, we know 52 people were convicted on that charge alone. 27 of them are still in prison. Bill, do they just open the prison gates now and let these people go free? Do they vacate all those convictions? What happens? Hello, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you for having me. Hello, Missy. No, not exactly. It works this way. Uh, the law was um, too uh, broad, according to the Supreme Court. And it's important to remember, Elizabeth, uh, the basis for 1512 a C2. It comes out of the Enron scandal. In 2002, Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, and that was because uh, when the public was outraged over Enron, some accountants had destroyed documents and there was nothing on the books uh, to uh, go to after them. With. So yeah. uh, now, 1-6, January 6th, is the first time we've seen this particular charge bought for these types of proceedings. And I think what the Supreme Court did in this case, uh, Mr. Fisher had some success with Judge Nichols in the District Court of uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, that was appealed. It was a 2-1 decision by the Circuit Court. And the Supreme Court said just being there is not enough. So they made a distinction between being present, even if you were inside the Capitol building, and uh, documents, and I think that's where but, the distinction yeah, uh, but comes Bill, in. Yeah, but they have, Bill, they have text messages from some of those defendants saying that, well, let's go there and obstruct this proceeding, and that's not enough. They have to have actually destroyed documents, according to the Supreme Court. Uh, according to this ruling, they yeah. focus very uh, laser-like on the document aspect of that particular statute, and that's what led to uh, the ruling overturning the D.C. Circuit Court uh, ruling. Right. And we should say most of the January 6th defendants were also charged with, most of them were just charged with assault and trespassing and vandalism. Um, listen, the big question, of course, is former President Trump is facing two counts of obstruction from special counsel Jack Smith's federal election subversion case. How will today's ruling impact that case? Misty, you first, then Bill. So to Bill's point, everything is going to be a fact-based analysis. So, Bill, that was great. You know, they're going to go back to the appellate court and see which defendants this, this decision actually implicates. Now, as far as it goes for Donald Trump, the prosecutor's argument is going to be that he actually fits right within this statute. And that's because his alleged conduct includes all that fake electorate slates, which would fall squarely into the manipulation of documentary evidence. So that's what prosecutors are going to argue. So this isn't going to impact the case moving forward, but he certainly may have an appellate argument as that case proceeds, just like we saw in this particular instance. Well, and it's worth noting, it's not just uh, the obstruction that EGP faces in this indictment, correct? 
Correct. Right. There's and other I charges that wouldn't Misty. be impacted. Okay, yeah. Phil, go uh, ahead. Elizabeth, I agree with Misty. Um, the, the, the dilemma that Jack Smith faces is as follows, though. If I understand that particular case, that indictment, there are four charges. Two uh, of obstruction, 1512, what we're dealing with here in the Fisher case, and then a uh, separate two, conspiracy to defraud the United States and the conspiracy to defraud the rights of voters. Uh, Smith has to think, uh, do I really want to ask uh, the jury to figure out how many angels can dance on the head of a pin with these two obstruction charges, yeah. or do I, do I shed these? Do I just get rid of these? Uh, proceed on the, the two remaining and take my chances because let's say he stays with all four. Let's say there's a conviction and let's say the defendant appeals successfully like Fisher did. The Supreme Court could say, well, uh, that only applies to the yeah. obstruction of rule. Or they could say that that bad law, knowing you're proceeding on bad law, tainted the other two charges. He could lose everything. It's all a calculated gamble. Uh, meantime, the Supreme Court announced it will reveal its long-awaited decision on whether or not President Trump, former President Trump, has immunity. Um, he has claimed complete immunity for anything he does as president, that the only recourse for any act is impeachment by Congress. How do you think the Supreme Court's going to rule on Monday? Bill, you first, then Misty. Uh, I think there's a, that's a really, a dangerous road that they're, they're uh, traveling on uh, with, with complete immunity versus uh, qualified or limited immunity. I think they're going to kick it down uh, to the uh, district court and say, uh, you know, there's qualified or limited immunity uh, and we are remanding for further rulings. Oh, I, great. I don't well, so more delays. <laughs> more, more delays. I don't think they're going to give a blanket uh, unlimited immunity. Misty? I actually think Bill's spot on, and I say that from what was really earmarked at the oral arguments, that it seems like the Supreme Court is not going the way of having some sort of unlimited immunity, but there is going to be immunity for certain official acts, which will require an analysis of what constitutes an official act by the lower court. So to your point, Elizabeth, a little bit of kicking the can and more analysis by the federal courts uh, before we actually get resolution on that issue. Well, and in which means for all intents and purposes a victory for former president trump who has successfully managed to get this thing delayed yet again uh bill brennan misty maris great to talk to you you too thank you thank all you. right